can't all come together if we've already set up parameters of what's going to split us apart. I'm, I'm African Native American. People have a fit when I say that. What did Mama say he was Cherokee? So, yeah. I told you, Jose Pimiento Bay wrote a PhD that said every Native American here was a woman. I have a book that says Native Americans have been in this continent 150,000 years. That's before Europeans got out of the Neanderthal state. You know, I mean, like if people say something to me, I'll just say, what's your source? If he said Noble Drew, does he belong to the Claudus L group? They're not a they're the L group, the Bay group, you know. Andy and Andy Bay and the Cloud Wars. You know, they're all kinds of uh, a more Moorish groups. Um, a golden age of the Moor, Jose Pinza Bay. He said. Hold on, hold on. Let me do this first. Let me do this first. It's all part of the discussion. It's all part of the discussion. <laughs> Excuse me, but in, uh, in in the golden age of the war, uh, in Jose Pinta Bay. Yeah, Jose wrote the chapter. Right, right. That's what messed up his PhD because he couldn't use the full time. Right, but he skipped over that section on the war, especially when he got to Diop. And he said Diop couldn't even explain it. So that he would not even really get, no, he quoted authors. But when you go to Bates, uh, or at Bates and different people, they don't really know who the Moors are. That's what and, I said. And, and if all the experts can't explain it, why even argue the issue? When because you read the exports. Uh, right, right. No, no, no. In the United States, Noble Drew Ali um, brought in a concept of Moors. There are people who are still following different parts of his called the Moorish Science Temple. Okay. There's a history and everything. So. It behooved the same way as somebody says, I'm Jewish. You say, are you, Has I don't know if you do, but you should say, are you Hasidic? Are you Sephardic? Are you Ashkenazi? We need to do the same thing. If you say, I'm Native American, they say, are you Lakota? Are you, Akur? you know, yeah, give, give some credence to how people, because we've been all split up. But, but if linguistically and... and, and linguistically, and more means mixed. Mixed, right. Well, if the people can't decide, why even give it creeds? Why even give this man any creeds? If he's stating something that is not, there are a lot of theories, well, but there are no real facts. facts. No, I wasn't no. here. I wasn't here. No, but what I was saying, to me, he can be a person who can come here and be wherever they want to be. <laughs> We just can't right. come down here and tell us we ain't African. That's but right. if the facts are not that clear, we don't want her. that we're not Africans. He can but say that. He can say it, but you know, it ain't something no, that we should agree with. He said if you want more than more African, if you want Negro, Negro, you're not. Right. 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 But that's impossible. I'm an African Native American. My husband's an African Jamaican. Uh, my best friend is an African Ghanaian. He's, he's a guy. There's no such thing as an African African. Africa is a continent. It's not a city. It's not a state. You know. So and this and this, uh, I believe, is one of our problems because we want to say we're African, but we don't want to pick your or, or you know. But we don't know. But, but you can learn it. You learn Christianity. <laughs> you can learn anything. This time it could be your choice. You could learn it. You'll find Yoruba is much more functional than the uh, dominant ones. <laughs> <laughs> Can um, somebody get the two boxes back there for the building fund? Go ahead, Dr. Bay. Um, Drew always said, um, we can ignorant as we are, and humble as we should be. He said, the Europeans put us into a psychology, European psychology. We didn't know what, what the hell we were. So we know we were in the darkness at one time. Now we're searching for light. So we, we have to be like kind of 
considerate to each other. Yes, sir. Till so we find it's true, the knowledge of the laws. And uh, Drelli said, we were not taught our nationality. Every European knows who he is. You're the only people that call yourself Negro, <coughs> Black, Color, Ethiopia. You don't know who to call you. So we have to get the foundation of who we want to be called and, and stop this confusion. That's what we're doing to our young people. Thank you. Europeans don't know who they are. Uh, Most in theory, they do. In theory. Most of the ancestors came over here as indentured slaves. You know, you know, check, check, check it out. Seventy-five percent of them were indentured, the low life of Europe. On, on that note, brothers and sisters, um, we should be farming. I believe in a couple, couple weeks. We're negotiating with the church last. So white people came and were greeted and helped all over this land. You know, they say the natives were friendly. They gave us corn and all that. And then what did they get in return? And so when you find yourself practicing this, I don't like you, you said you this, and you said you this, I'm telling you, somebody accosted me the other day said, why do you call yourself an American, Native American? That's a European construct. I said, no, it isn't. America is a word that comes from Nicaragua, from the Sierra Americas Mountains, and the Los Americos people who had the mountain of gold that Alberico Vespucci changed his name to America's Vespucci so he could steal the gold. And they named this place after him who had named him after us. And the footnote for that is Fulcrum of Change by Jan Carew. Fulcrum of change by Jan Carew. And we, like, same thing we'd be arguing about more. Like, all this stuff more, we don't know. Because I told you, just like this book said, the whole process of what you're reading is a process of editorial concordance with whatever keeps them in the dominant class. Mm -hmm. And when you read something, the first thing you should say, I wonder what is wrong with that. I don't <laughs> care what it is that you do. You know, don't write, oh, I didn't know that. Say, I wonder if that is just another trip down, let me be the big boy's play. Mm -hmm. And if you're in college, do it even more, but write the line. <laughs> <laughs> On that note, this is our next, hopefully, if Brenda and the brother here. Out there so that they will know carrots don't come in packages and milk doesn't come in cartons. Oh, you're laughing. No, no, Kids serious. don't know anything about cows. appreciate that. That's true. They don't know. They don't know. You'd be surprised. They don't have the slightest idea where food comes from. Put them on a, you know, get, maybe you get some money from the city. Put them in a little work center. My mother used to send me out to New Hampshire farm with chickens and and potatoes and stuff, because, you know, or the Caribbean, send them to the Caribbean for, you know, a couple of months where they learn where yams and, and, um... Brother, you right. hey, You want to um, speak on anything that you're doing with, with um, Brother Chairs in Jersey City? Uh, right now, we, we were at uh, Stan, so we haven't really... Do you? Yeah, me and you. It means little you. Little you. And it means if you're a mule, it means you can't produce grandchildren. You can produce, a, you know, like a tiger and a lion can produce a liger. Well, like a mule, a donkey and a pig. I mean, yeah, that's right. they can't produce. So when you call people mulatto, uh, it's very much the Moors were also in that mixed group. It was the white man's way of saying that we could not reproduce, that we were hybrid. In fact, this is in my book. And so we need to understand when we call each a Sambo. I am a Sambo. I'm half Native American and half African. That's what Sambo meant. Most African Americans are Sambo. How many people in here have Native American ancestry? Cherokee? Oh, look, look at all these Sambos. So I'm just saying we don't know what these terms meant because the white man calls us these things pejoratively. Right. Just like you call the white man 
Now, that's giving him honor white because he's not really white. He's really pale. But we use the word white. To me, white is the absence of anything. That's why I call him white. But he's still pale. But he's pale. It's not actually. He's white to me because he's. Well, this is white. Right here. So that's white. That piece of paper there. No, that piece of paper. I do. I do it ideologically. But that would be correct, though. Well, it's just my usage of the language. Okay, so um, that was just to that was just to put that on the record. And brother, it's good to see you got uh, after all these years you've got this so uh He talks about slavery and how blacks began getting into this uh, criminal justice system after slavery, and he talks about the chain gangs and many of the um, southern prison systems as a form of perpetuating slavery. Are you familiar with that man? I think he has I'm a whole thesis. I challenge that thesis. My book challenges that thesis. My book chronicles the development of the prison system while we were in slavery. Free blacks during slavery were put in prison. They said freedom made us crazy and criminals. So if, if we were slaves, we were fine. See, if you have a slave system in the South, they didn't need prisons because they just put you back in slavery. But in, in, in my book, I show how even though you were born free, if you did something they said was illegal, you see the front of the book? It says free blacks were put into slavery. They're put back where they never been in. Because what they were trying to do, when you had the American revolt, what we call a what we call a revolution was never a revolution. They want us to concentrate on slavery, but that's not true. That's true. There was never a revolution. The suckers were fighting to get into the American system. No taxes without representation. And they accidentally won the war. And then they had to create a country out of 13 disparate colonies, half in the South and half in the North. And so they, they had a half million black people, most in slavery, but 60,000 were free. And they didn't know what to do with these free blacks. So the ones in the South were good buffer groups. They built Charleston and all those cities. So they kept them. They didn't have to worry about them. But the ones in the North, like Frederick Douglass, you know all that? They would not let you work with white people, even though you had all the skills in the world. If they caught you on the street and you had no money in your pocket, even if you had papers that said you were free, they arrested you for being a vagrant. The second night you were in jail, you were in jail for being a debtor. You owed for the first night. <laughs> since there were no black lawyers, and since you had to get white people to plead your case, and you were in jail, there was no place for you to go, just like they do the brothers in the prisons right out here at the airport, and just like they do the brothers in the prison at Rikers Island. They're not charged with anything. They're being detained because they don't have bail, you know, they, they can't play their bond. The system was created in 17 Nine. And what I said is blacks are in prison for the same reason ants are in air housing. The prisons were built to hold black. And the proof is, in the four years my book has been out, you now have over a million brothers in prison. It was only 600,000 three years ago. And by the year 2000, there will be two million. Now, if you read this man's book, I forget his name, but it's a Marxist analysis, they're going to tell you it has to do with the workers and all that, but it doesn't have anything to do with that. I argue that blacks are in prisons because prisons are designed for deviants, people that go against the social law. And in a white society designed to have blacks in and whites free. Free blacks are deviant. And that's why they put you behind your jail. 
And that's why OJ found not guilty. He was never going to be free. Mm -hmm. Mike Tyson did his time. He was never going to be free. Every brother, sister, you need to understand because you're the next population growing faster than the brother's population. And the sin, you're going to say, I'd like this. You talk about the sister in, in, um, in the circumcision. They wouldn't do that to a white woman. They did that to her because she's black, because she comes from African culture. And until we analyze the system that dominates us, that's what I'm trying to do, analyze the system that dominates us, not because we're black and because they're white, but because black people do what white people do, because white people do what white people do. <laughs> <laughs> and if you look at the way they treat their children, if you look at the way they treat their old folks, and you argue about what they do to you, it doesn't make any difference. If there were no black people in this society, you would have the same society. It just wouldn't be racist, it would be ethnocentric. They did, my book starts with the Irish. Mm -hmm. And then the Native Americans. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. They had all this in place before they even dealt with anybody black. And that's a mistake we made. It's a, to me, it's a major mistake. And somebody said, you don't like me because I'm white. And I said, no, no, no. I don't like you because you're not likable. <laughs> you're being white, you're just an accident. <laughs> you know? <laughs> now we need to think about that. Mm -hmm. There are some good white people. But we shouldn't give any white people the benefit of the doubt. <laughs> the sad thing about it is we can't give black people the benefit of the doubt. Because we've got with some European. Um hold up. <laughs> Welcome back, Harold. Oh, thank you. <laughs> uh, um, have you read David McRitchie's Ancient and Modern Britain? And I have, I have a book, The History of England, I forget who it's by, but it's fantastic. And I've also read Standard's Analysis of Britain, but I haven't read that one, but it's awesome. Right, well, he, he talks about, um, about the bloodlines being confused and about the blacks owning the titles and the land. And if you were Irish, you were black. The plaid was ours. That's what Mick means. My name right. is McIntyre, right. Mac 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 Mac. right, and the whites came and stole the land and the titles mm -hmm. and the whole Irish thing, which we should be celebrating. Yeah. But it, it, he details the extermination. He, um, he chronicles the lodges that the people lived in and what they did, um, how the uh, uh, black male is something that the black kings would tribute off the land. So, just because they worked with the land and they got dirty and Europeans up until the 16th century yep. never washed in their entire lives. Yep. So they, they, they worked in physically possible? Huh? How was that physically possible? You just don't wash. You have fleas and lice and mice running through your body. How was it possible? Well, if you think it's impossible for men, imagine a woman who never washed. <laughs> <laughs> Which is why they used to go on 25-year trips and rape all the women uh, in, the, in the women of color who bathed every day. There's a reason for white men not liking their women. They never washed in their entire lives. I mean, you know, see, we, we have been so indoctrinated into this white and black, but dirt. It's probably in this book, but there's a book named Dirt. Yes. But Dirt, blackness didn't mean your complexion. Blackness meant your station in life, your peasant. Right. And when they said they're black, there are two things. I didn't bring up my lecture today, but there are two things. If you couldn't read, you were called black, because that meant you were an agricultural worker. You know, you, were, you, you couldn't do books and stuff. When Israel was created, and you got the Yemenites and the Falasha and all those people over there, then they said, or oh, even, even the Jews from Europe that couldn't read were all put 
in the agricultural belt. So we weren't the only people, but see, Africans, Native Americans, revered the earth and liked to work with the earth. But of course, we bathed every day. So you gotta understand the system of domination. And there was no water. In Europe, the water was cold. And did you see my fair lady? Anybody here see my fair lady? And they go to Washington, she said, I'll catch me death of cold, or death of, you know. Because even today, the, the washing, the calling of hair, that's all something we had to do. Now think about it. Columbus comes off a boat with holes in it. A boat with holes in it. Native Americans who made the canoe and the kayak, you know, an unsinkable boat. And they look up and they see these nasty looking creatures who never washed in their entire life, never combed their hair, and they are coming in on the, just imagine, and you and I and the rest of us go down the Tainos, go down to the shore to get some sea fish or whatever, and look up and see this boat with holes in it. You know, with the, and you say, and, and we said, oh, here comes God. <laughs> Isn't that the way they tell you the story? Yes, ma'am. Here comes God. You mean, here comes God. But then, <laughs> so, the, the, there's, a, there's a book, I'll, 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 I'll give it to you. It is fantastic. It talks about how they never buried their dead. They just fill up, um, uh, what do you call it, um, a ditch. They just throw the dead in there, fill up the ditch until it got full. The Thames, you know what the Thames is, the river in England? Had so much rubbish in it that ships couldn't sail up and down. It was so nasty. That's where you got the plague with the rats running all over. And the only thing that got rid of one set of rats was another set of rats, okay? The reason men walk on the outside of women, and the reason women wear high heels is so they didn't have to step in the awful and the, and the garbage and stuff, and they had balconies and they'd throw their rubbish over, and so the guy would catch the rubbish. This is, this is what I'm saying. What he's saying, you should read the book, any book. Any an honest book, fairly honest book, on European culture would say, I don't want to be like this people. Mm -hmm. Jean uh, Jacques was Rousseau, social project, abandoned all seven of his kids. There's a book called The Kindness of Strangers. Mm -hmm. yes. White people abandoned his kids, and he said they were just in the way. They left them on the church stairs or out in the street. Now what are we doing? What are the people in Africa doing today? Abandoning our children. Nothing in the world of people of color ever abandoned their children until we became European. Even we, you know, and so the history, not just ancient Britain, did you say? Or Europe. Britain. Yeah. You don't need to just, Britain is, 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 is um, uh, when you look at Ireland, and you wonder why they're still fighting? Mm -hmm. You didn't read my book. <laughs> no, no. And when I was studying this, the Irish had a culture similar to Native American culture. Mm -hmm. They wore leather, they followed the herd, they had more than one wife. They kept them and got rid of them when they wanted to. They drank beer, you know, their own kind of beer. They had a free, they, they roamed claims in Ireland. The British came in and said, put fences up. Change the way of life, one wife. Work. And I mean, they were working because they were cattle men, but they wanted them to work and grow whatever crop the British had. The British more than any other group changes your culture. And they don't have that. Look at their music. 
The best music they have is the magical. You know. Mm -hmm. What else? <laughs> they, so, one of the things about the way our historians have read our history as if Europe gave us something. Right. And I have yet to find out what they gave us besides disease. What did they give us? They had no script. They had no God. They got the God from the Near East. And, you know, what did they give us? And so, what I've been trying to do is figure out how did they make us believe they gave us so much. And that's what I was trying to tell you about them giving us the Bible, you know how they say, when the British came, they had the Bible and we had the land, mm -hmm. and now they have the land and we have the Bible. Mm -hmm. And a constant editorial process that redefines the Bible with them as the emulation of God. And they describe God as white male, and then they give you a picture of Michelangelo's brother and tell you that's the son of God. <laughs> And I don't blame Michelangelo, but if I had brought a picture of my brother in here and said, you all would say, Shaw, she's crazy. But every other ethnic group, yet 1995 or 94, um, life or look, they have 30 or 40 pictures of Jesus in every ethnic group except African Americans. We have one new idea. So you got to look at the process. That's what I want you to do. And you can't look at the process unless you read books like Patrick Zeckerman. What's it? Oh, um, Power. Power. You can't. And that's what each one of you should do. One, each one of you should take a look. You should start, you know, you have lectures, it's okay. But you should take, take pick a subject. And everybody, remember how I did the trial? Everybody picks a different aspect of that dungeon and then come in here with round <coughs> Oh, yeah. Look at this. Boy, are the ancestors with me today? <laughs> oh, I don't even have to bring show and tell. <laughs> now, this defies all intelligence. Because, in the first place, where was Jesus born? <laughs> where was he born? Huh? No, no, where does the Bible say He was a Nazarene, wasn't he? Yeah. He was born. So he had to at least be brought You ever seen anybody born? <laughs> Except the imports from Europe. <laughs> and with a miniature Caesar search for Jesus. Well, if they're searching for him, they ain't never gonna find him. <laughs> 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 Old folk up there was searching. And notice this. This is time and this is U.S. news. Do you think this is an accident? Yes, yes, ma'am. <laughs> <laughs> but you remember what they said about the sister that let the sister out and had nothing to do with the protest? Why, why would these people lie? No, these people don't lie. These people rationalize their entire existence. They don't even know the truth. And when you tell them it's the truth, it, it doesn't matter nothing. You know, one of my students said, uh, Shashi, can you... Can you, she took my Native American class, she got a B. The last day of class she said, can you, and needless to say I have brought all the documentation, she said, can you uh, give me a reference for the Native American being here before Columbus? <laughs> she took the class. <laughs> and I said, excuse me, who did Columbus see when he got here? She said, I said, were there any people on the shore? And she said, yes. I said, well, who do you think they were? She said, well, they were the people here. I said, will you listen to yourself? 
<laughs> well, you see, no, and she said, but I need a real, she needed, what was that say? Do you want me to give you a book by somebody white? <laughs> and this sister was part Cherokee from South Carolina. Mm -hmm. And after a semester of me, mm -hmm. you know how much I give up. Same. And, yeah, and I said, this is, this is, you understand what I'm saying? But, you know, but can you give me something white? And I, that's when I started saying, look, lady, I got five degrees in this white man's food, sir. <laughs> you ain't gonna find nobody on this campus got more. And my husband, the head of the music department, and has several damn more degrees. But what do you want from me? She wanted somebody white. Uh, I have a question. You're not fine. You don't work out. <laughs> <laughs> I have a question. Basically, uh, uh, in relationship to the, uh, uh, the younger generations coming up, uh, uh, and it's in relationship to what you were talking about when you were saying they were, you mentioned about you know, white people, then you said the tragedy amongst us, we don't have, say, some sort of forgiveness amongst our own self. Um, my question has to do with, <clears throat> I, wanted, I wanted to, I'm asking this in, uh, in terms of the future generation, I'm asking, I want to see uh, some of your philosophical construct or analysis on a situation that you have uh, here in the black community where you have like, for example, uh, you have like an elder uh, historian. <clears throat> uh, oops, I'm gonna play devil, devil's advocate I'm going to play devil's advocate mm -hmm. and say that you claim to, you yourself claim to know uh, Malcolm X, you claim to know um, uh, uh, Farrakhan, uh, and you have some sort of positive outlook on it. Mm -hmm. um, May your man march. Uh, mm -hmm. we, have, um, we have one elder historian uh, who sees uh, no positive anything about the May your man march. She's nothing positive. <laughs> She's nothing positive in uh, uh, Farrakhan nor um, Malana, Malana Karenga. And anytime he, he speaks, he's, he has a whole diatribe of uh, character assassination. Um, the young people don't have the experience to know what, when, when I went back down. I mean, I wanted, so I want to know uh, how do you, what's your philo philosophical construct on reconciling, uh, looking at this? Because this even came up, I think, in one of your. Uh, conferences at the African Heritage Studies Association in, uh, in Philadelphia a couple of years ago. You had some, some sort of yeah, problem. It's hard. Yeah, so I want to get some of how you see how this is to be reconciled this week. Were you there? No, uh, I came in late. You know, Dr. Clark has given so much to the African community that if in, his if, in, if in his memory bank, he finds it untenable to accept these two men that most of us like, that's his right. That's his right. When I get to be 80 something years old, um, before that probably, I may have some people that I don't like. I, I knew Lewis a long time. I told you all I knew him when he was the trauma. I've seen him transform. I've seen him go to the bottom. I've seen him make a choice uh, for Elijah over Malcolm. And you know if you look at any videos of Malcolm, you will see Lewis sitting right here. But as a historian, I know had five times chosen Malcolm, he'd be dead. It wasn't a choice of who to follow, it was a choice of whether you want to live or die. And that is not to say that I believe that the Muslims killed Malcolm. But I, I knew the Muslims well at that time. Two of my nephews were Muslims even now. And Lewis and Rodney Smith were co ministers of the temple in Boston, which was a rough temple. And uh, if, 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 if Farrakhan, which is seven or eight dollars, 11 kids, had made that choice, it would have been a martyr choice. You understand what I'm saying? He didn't have any choice. 
I mean, you all can talk this foolishness. Betty, Malcolm's wife, had to go to Africa for almost a year. They didn't just try to kill Malcolm, whoever did it. They tried to kill the whole family. Let's look at the real historical reality. So from that flight, he had to come back, go to Chicago, be a nothing in Chicago because he wasn't known, you know, having been the big bird in New York. And then something spoke to him, and he went back to a larger way. And history will read him right. History will read his choice right. Now, it may be because you know Dr. Clark wrote Malcolm, the man in his time. And a long time I was angry with Lewis myself. But I believed in redemption. I learned that from Malcolm. Now, I, I worked with Lewis on the Million Man March with Ben Chambers and stuff. I don't believe that my posture is so great that I can go around judging people. Whoever is the judge will do the judging. I am not the judge. You come to judge it, ain't me. And I think that we make a major mistake if we don't have a real critique. Dr. Clark's critique of Farrakhan is that he's a hype. I don't believe that. I don't believe that, and I know that he is suffering from prostate cancer, and I'm very worried about Minister Fonka. I'm suffering from lupus, and I know what it is to look death in the face of the death. Karenda is a little different story. Dr. Clark never was a Karenda fan. I brought Karenda into AHSA because I thought what he contributed to the struggle was too big for us to ignore him in 82 when he wrote his book. And then Pawansa and all that, I thought that was a major contribution and he should be part of HSA. And then when he had his battle with Ben and Dr. Clark in Africa, that was a personal confrontation that nobody then tried to, Jake Carruthers tried to, and Asa Hilliard tried to mediate. And that's what I was trying to do here. Because if you can, if you can get the collective wisdom of a Karenga, a Farrakhan, and a Clark, how much more useful would it be for us as a people than to have, well, Karenga work with Farrakhan and the rest of us on the name so, But, you know, we can't afford to lose Dr. Clark. And I told him at Winnie Mandela's last week, I said, I spent 25 years of my life. But you know, of age yourself. I held that organization together after dying and coming back, and I've died a couple of times in between. And you know, even when I was your teacher, AHSA, I said, John, that's my legacy to you. That's my paying my debt to you. And we're not going to let you go. So he's going to have to confront me. He's going to have to confront me. Because I'm going to do that. I'm going to say, John, you created this organization. We led the battle for black study because we believed in you. John was, you know, that's the spiritual fountain. And I, I know you don't like everybody. I could tell you some other people he doesn't like. I said, you've learned to tolerate them. You know, he doesn't like me. Oh, hard-headed gal woman. You know, but that's okay. Because I know, and I believe that about Firetown, and I believe that about Karenga that they believe in what they're doing. I don't have to believe in what they're doing. They believe in what they're doing. And that's all I ask. That's all we should ask. We can then say, you're not doing it right, or you're doing it wrong. You understand what I'm saying? But if the person is sincere in the quest, and I think they are, don't you? Put your face on the camera. <laughs> She's going out alone. <laughs> Thank you, sis. We'll get together again with Charles before the end of the summer. Thank you.